Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Send It. I'm joined here. Uh, I'm joined with my co-host, Wajat. How are you, my friend? Doing well, as always. Thank you. Very nice to see you. And today, Wajat, we have quite the amazing guests, to be honest. Quite excited for uh, this one. We have Anna and Felix from uh, CowSwap. How are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you guys for coming, honestly. I think you guys are uh, busier than us. Although Waj is pretty busy. He's not, uh, he's not like uh, me. He's actually a busy guy. But I'm sure that you do it on a different level uh, than both of us uh, combined, to be honest. So what's up, guys? How are you? Yeah, working um, on making progress with CalSwap. Um, it's going in the right direction. So overall, very happy about the team and where we are at right now. We have a lot of interesting things happening at the moment. We just um, enabled the fee switch for um, Cal Protocol to start wow. putting the protocol on a few, on a bit more kind of economically sound um, feet. And That's are also, deal. yeah, and are also working on um, on a nice AMM design that um, will allow us to take what we've done for traders in the past, protecting them from MEV and sandwiching to also apply that to LPs who um, historically have been hit by LDR and, and, and other kind of um, toxic uh, trading flow. And, and we're hoping that we can um, solve MEV also for this group of, of people. Hopefully we'll do it uh, pretty soon, pretty soon. But I would like to, us to like take a step back. And uh, let's first of all, for those uh, viewers who actually know nothing about CowSwap, how do you even uh, like? How do you guys begin to explain what CowSwap actually is? And uh, Anna, maybe you can go uh, with it or whoever whoever wants. So if we are really talking about the audience has no idea whatsoever what CowSwap is, I think we like to make this analogy to um, we are the Google flights of the Dex trading. Um, so essentially, if you want to place whatever order. Um, to execute a trade, you can go to CowSwap and it gives you the best possible price that's available on chain. So it would essentially check um, what are the existing price points of the existing IMMs, the existing on-chain liquidity. It would even check um, what are the, the price points of other DEX aggregators, such as 1inch, Paris, or Zero X. And it would um, also add additional liquidity, for example, um, market maker liquidity, and then find the best route for the user. But it adds one innovation on top, which is that it is also able to match user orders peer to peer. So essentially, um, if it finds a connection between one user order and another one that they can execute the trades against each other, it can do so as well. And ultimately the result is that it gives you better gas execution, gives you better, like lower price impact and ultimately an overall better solution for the user. Not, not, not exactly the simplest of uh, products out there, isn't it, Waj? Well, I mean, when you go to the application, it looks very simple. That's yeah, what I love about true, it. True. But I think uh, kind of taking that, co taking complexities with solving all of these big issues that we have with using some of these decentralized exchanges, things like MEV, uh, for example, things like slippage, things like gas. These are things that I think we needed to improve. And I think CowSwap does it really, really well. Um, so yeah, thank you for that explanation. And I think you brought up a good point. Like it sounds complicated, but the user experience is not. And this is exactly what we are striving to achieve. Like blockchain in itself is like for a lot of users who are like not deeply familiarized with the works around it. They can easily get confused. They are like not sure what is the slippage tolerance they should put, like what are external risks that exist, how should they protect their trade. And this is essentially what CowSwap is built for. You as a user, you don't have to understand the exact works. You don't have to understand the exact risks. Uh, you can place your trade on CowSwap with like an ease of mind and ensure that you get the best possible execution. And this is kind of the UX we are striving for. Yeah, um, I was just going to ask, um, going back to like the original idea behind Cow Protocol and CowSwap, um, what was like the the main issue back then? I know the protocols had a number of iterations in, in, in the last couple of years. What was the first like idea behind it? 
Yeah, maybe I can. I... Yeah, maybe like the backstory. I think that you told us a bit about it uh, on the Leviathan show a few days ago, uh, Felix, right? Yeah, so when I joined Gnosis, uh, the company that Cal Protocol eventually spun out of in 2018, um, Gnosis founder Martin Koppelman um, talked to me about this idea of um, having blockchain basically be uh, the venue where we can create all kinds of assets uh, permissionlessly and trade them in the most effective way. But in order to do so, we have to actually um, not just look at the way that trading happens in the traditional financial system, where we have a common numeraire, the US dollars, most of the um, pairs that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange or um, other venues are denominated in US dollars. This t- doesn't really exist on, on, on Ethereum. Sure, you could say, well, maybe Ether is, is your common numeraire, but then, you know, a lot of people in the traditional financial system might still want to um, not expose their markets in something that's as volatile as Ether. Um, if you're looking at, you know, trying to ne- put your, your uh, markets, denominate them in US dollar, the question is, what is the US dollar? We have 10, 15, 20 different stable coins that are all trying to denominate the same uh, token pair. So really what kind of you know, Gnosis at the time realized in 2018 is that we need to, we, we are we're fighting with this like, with this explosion of um, token space, so this complosion, like uh, what is it called? It's a um, Cambrian explosion of complexity of um, you know people trading different pairs. Uh, it's free for anyone to create a token, so we're just having this massive set of of, of possibilities to trade on. And the most effective way to actually um, re-aggregate that fragmented liquidity is not by matching people individually against individual AMMs on each of those potentially you know, massive amount of pairs, but instead putting them all together in kind of one big multidimensional batch um, in economic terms, it's sometimes called a barter economy where um, you don't really care uh, what your fiat numeraire is. You just you know, have a good and you want to buy a good. Uh, and somebody else has another good and wants to buy another good and you know everyone just meets at this you know, big market like in the medieval age and you then have a you know very smart computer program that just uh, takes all the demand takes all the supplies and tries to uh, find a matching that clears demand and supply and uh, everyone goes home and basically has the good that they that they want to have and with gnosis this was particularly interesting because um, they were working on prediction markets at the time and if you're looking at um, what you might want to express in a prediction market it could be any question about you know your local soccer club to something in your you know the menu in your restaurant maybe um, you know your local politicians but in order to actually get significant liquidity behind all these types of open questions and and markets you might want to um, put into prediction markets you will never be able to find that liquidity. And so the, the original idea was to use batch auctions as a means to re-aggregate fragmented liquidity and find a way of um, f- very effectively trade with people without requiring those market makers and, and massive um, kind of banks of, of, of um, liquidity in the, in the middle. Um, that was the idea, but of course, uh, you know, it took many, 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 many uh, iterations to get there. Um, I think when we started out, we actually already looked at uh, coincidence of ones in multiple dimensions, how we can use ZK rollups and layer two technology to make sure we can settle 10,000 trades in one block. And, and that was, you know, fun, good times in 2018 until we realized that, well, okay, before we have to tackle the problem of scalability, we actually have to tackle the problem of, of getting people to care about this mechanism, mechanism and getting adoption. And so in 2019, we started to build um, a first prototype of this batch exchange where people would place their orders. Back in the day, gas was cheap, so everything was happening on chain. Uh, we would then close the batch, give it off to a network of you know, super intelligent uh, optimization programs, which try to solve this uh, NP hard problem using um, a set of heuristics and come out with the optimal uh, allocation five minutes later and then clear the trades. You know, that sounded very nice, but uh, in practice, people hated the fact that they have to first put up their order and then wait five minutes for their order to get settled. Um, and so this product that was called Mesa didn't really get any traction except for a few um, initial token offerings that, that basically were not time sensitive and wanted to make sure that their users actually can bid in an auction rather than um, getting sniped from, from MEV bots and, and up treasurers. And so I think it was end of 2019 that we decided to go back to the drawing board board and think, what does it need to take this idea of 
aggregated liquidity in a batch settled at um, a uniform clearing price. So making sure that if we both trade the same asset in the same batch, it doesn't matter who comes first, we get exactly the same, the same execution. What does it take to take this idea to something that people actually really like? And about that time is when Anna joined the team and, and I think she can uh, take the rest of the story from there. Yeah, this is maybe where um, it becomes interesting to understand um, why our product is called CowSwap. I think this is sometimes a little bit irritating oh, yeah. for people. <laughs> and, uh, I have no idea why it's called what. Yeah, I'd love to know why. I never get it. I never get it. Ah, okay. So that that's that's sad, actually. <laughs> that even you guys don't know what it, what it stands for. But um, essentially, so we did a bit of research into... Um, what differentiates our exchange from existing competitors and like looked at it from multiple dimensions like looking at uniswap sushi swap balancer and like analyzing what is every one of those what are do what are they doing good what they're doing not so good what's like working for them how do we differentiate from that and <clears throat> uh, again back then we were still part of gnosis I think we have always been taken very seriously for our technology, <clears throat> but um, it was what what was missing a little bit was like this um, strong belief of finding adoption and like a meme factor behind it. Um, so everybody took it out. Oh, this is a very strong technology and like they're ahead of like research, but um, is it actually something that the consumer wants to use? And um, so we basically did a brainstorm with the team together and then someone came up with this fun idea of calling it cow swap because it stands for coincidence of wants. So that describes this economic concept of being able to match different trades together. Like essentially if Absolutely. one user has something that the other one wants and vice versa, you're able to match them directly. Um, so coincidence of one COW um, so, and then we did like a brainstorming round with multiple team members and like um, really iterate on if we call it cow swap, how, where can we take it? How, how good is this meme? And we instantly came up with like so many, it was like a huge list of potential meme memifications around it, um, presented it to the rest of the team. And I think they were kind of convinced that we decided to go for it. And this is how we added like a more fun branding around a serious concept that economically works super well, but at the same time is also attractive for the end user. That's so cool, actually, because, you know, if, if I remember, I'm not sure when it was, but when I uh, first heard of CowSwap, it really took me uh, a while to uh, to even take a look at it because it was too mimi in a way. Like, I, I didn't really, uh, I, I thought, okay, it's it's probably some kind of a joke. It's probably like all these, like, Doge tokens, like, bonk. <laughs> but you must admit, Doge got a lot of adoption, a lot of attention yeah. from that perspective. I, I, and it seems I remember, like, oh, my, oh, my. go ahead, Felix. I, I remember quite vividly that in the early days, we had a, you know, early supporter or, like, you know, community chat, and I think there was... Um, Hasu and Pulpitako and a bunch of other people. And we had exactly that conversation in that in that Telegram group. Um, is it too Mimi? And the argument for why we decided, no, it's not too Mimi, was the fact that basically the people in that group were, you know, an octopus, uh, a, a cartoon character. And like, you know, the, the space as a whole is, is, is actually, you know, um, built on top of memes. And I think what Anna said earlier, this, this is something that lacked, um, it knows it's lacked for a while to go beyond just okay what is the technical competence yeah. and you know the, the the great idea coincidence of once and matching people peer to peer but bringing this to a level where um people that maybe are not so familiar with like the economic details can appreciate the product we're building can have fun with the product we're building and basically get the both the best of both worlds uh, a great product but as, at the same time a great technology and yeah, I think this is really what what we what we nailed with 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 the name and what we nailed with with CowSwap and and yeah the reason why it, it took off um, in in two thousand and and uh, yeah twenty one and and we are where we are now. How long did it, did it take for it to like really start uh, picking up? Uh, like, did, did you uh, like announce the new name and was it actually like pretty quickly and swiftly that you guys got uh, a different response from uh, what it was before? 
so we launched a new product with the new name. Um, essentially, we were before we were working on like a, the, the the similar protocol that Felix was describing before that had that was having some UX issues, like the timing of auctions actually taking five minutes, and then also other issues such as users had to deposit funds on chain, hence had to pay gas costs for it. Um, and then we went back to the drawing board and created what we then launched under the new name CowSwap. So it, it was a new it was a new protocol that we launched. And it immediately, it was compared to the other products we had launched, it immediately had some consumer adoption that gave us um, really the, the motivation to continue and double down on it. So the, the first week, essentially, it had so many new users and volume to an extent that it was much, much larger than what the previous protocols had achieved, um, <clears throat> that we were convinced to continue working on it. And then soon, like the initial version was actually very simple. I think we had only um, Uniswap integrated as underlying liquidity and only a few weeks later actually um, added SushiSwap. So it was very far from what the product is today. Today is much, much more advanced, but even though um, we managed to capture like a good market and then we kept rolling out feature after feature after feature. And so we gained continuously growing adoption over time. To, so to be fair, I think, go ahead. I think we also, yeah, we also, we also um, were quite fortunate with the timing because around that time, I think it was actually 2020, if I'm not mistaken, was also when Flashbots um, MEV research started to become really um, mainstream and, and picked up a lot of attention and, and you know, it was the bull market. People were gambling uh, tons of money at, you know, people were not caring about two, 3% slippage tolerance if they think that their bags will do 10x the next day. So that was also a prime um, habitat for, for, for searchers and MEV uh, profiters. And so uh, when we launched, and, and you'll probably go into this in, in a bit more detail, but um, one of the core value propositions of CowSwap is that it protects users from sandwiching, from front running, from all kinds of uh, maximal extractable value that, that exists out there. Um, and I think you know, we had the meme, we had the, 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 the fun product, which fit into the time, but also um, it was actually a prime moment to come up and, and to present an MEV solution. And as such, we were the first, um, I would say, significant one in, in, in the space. Um, and, and that definitely helped as well with adoption. So I just double checked. It was 2021, though, that we launched. Okay. So actually, like, what was the... Uh... Uh, again, how, how what, what was exactly the first product that you guys have launched? Like, how would you define it in the narrowest uh, way? I would say, um, um, oh, so you mean the, the, the first product that was CowSwap? I think that was what Anna said, was basically a very thin layer on top of existing Uniswap pools, where we just say, if you're the only one, we'll match you against the Uniswap pool. But if you're together with somebody else, then we will first, um, you know, match you directly with one another and then just take the access onto that that Uniswap pool. So we just built a very, very thin batching layer on top of existing liquidity, starting with Uniswap and then slowly expanding and eventually decentralizing this whole process of matching and finding the best solution away from the core protocol into the hand of these external uh, matching engines, which we now call solvers. And the, and the MEV part came immediately after? Like, is it something that you guys planned uh, in advance and you knew that, like, uh, this is going to be, like, the second layer uh, that you guys are, uh, will be adding and, uh, like, uh, had that planned, I, I imagine? Yeah, so so this was this can actually get back to the, the very first designs, why we decided to go with batch auction. One example or one reason was the um, re-aggregation of fragmented liquidity, as I already mentioned. But the other one was that we observed um, the first decentralized exchange protocols on Ethereum had what we thought was a fundamental design flaw in that they allowed the same asset to be traded at different prices within the same Ethereum block. Basically, pools like Uniswap or SushiSwap um, build a pseudo first come first serve priority into their mechanism, where if you're buying something on a Uniswap pool and I'm buying something on a Uniswap pool, and we both do that in the same block, 
you know, effectively we do this at the very same instant in time. There's no, you know, no, no, nobody of us that really goes first. It's, it's the same moment in time. However, the, the builder or validator or miner at the time needs to somehow order our transactions in one way or the other. And just the way that the Uniswap mechanism works is that whoever goes first gets the old um, previous price, updates the price to a higher level. And then the person that goes second needs to um, trade at the, at the higher um, price and, and moves the price up even more. And this leads to these um, games where basically, well, if we both trading in the same block, you want to go before me and I want to go before you. Um, and if you're both retail traders, we probably don't really know about this. So something you know ends up happening kind of randomly, but we can be sure that there's some uh, sophisticated player somewhere in the corner watching out what people put in the mempool. And then if they see that there is a way to reorder transaction in a way for them to profit, to buy an asset at a low price and resell it within the same block, um, at a higher price, then they will um, do so, and they will um, convince the, the the miner at the time, or now the validator, to include the transaction ordering that is most beneficial for them and least beneficial for you. And the way to break this uh, kind of pseudo time price priority ordering within the block is to just say one asset has just a single price per block. So if you and I trade the same asset within the same block, we do so at the exact same execution price the, the, the exact same clearing price and you can only get this mechanism by re-aggregating um, all trades into one batch uh, because ethereum doesn't really allow you to um, apply constraints such as you get the same execution as me if we are both sending raw ethereum transaction into the public mempool so we need to have this kind of higher level uh, expression language intense is what they're usually called where you're saying well here's my limit order and here's my limit order and then you rely on this meta system to basically um, come up with the clearing and and provide these fairness guarantees that two assets the same asset will always be traded um, at the same price within a block and and fundamentally this is what i believe um, kills 99 percent of, of mev um, even uh, loss versus rebalancing or um, other kind of lp kind of mev even liquidation mev or you know what we see sometimes with uh, oracle backruns all of this really comes from the fact that the same asset can be traded at different prices within the same block. And so somebody buys it low, resells it high and makes a profit. There's just one price per token per block. All or most, if not all MEV goes away and we don't need, um, you know, heavy infrastructure solutions or other kind of systems that really um, become a tax or burden on the Ethereum base layer, but instead, um, you know, build sane applications that, that prevent uh, MEV at the at the application layer. That's one of my favorite features. Um, I remember back in 2020 and 2021, I loved using Uniswap uh, quite a lot to trade, let's say, altcoins, you could say. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happened to me all the time was I used to get sandwiched attack a lot. Uh, and it used to be really annoying. I don't know how much ETH I've lost from MEV. Uh, and since like CowSwap has introduced it, um, I think uh, it's been a game changer for me anyway, so not only in just savings, but also just better execution, better price execution. And I really like that, um, how, how you've explained it, Felix. Uh, thank you for that. What I wanted to um, ask next was, um, uh, so MEV is like really like a core feature of, of CalSwap, but users who go to CalSwap, what other features can they expect? Yeah, MEV is essentially just something that is underlyingly helping them for getting a better execution. Um, but then in terms of what features you can experience when you try it on CallSwap is obviously like the simple swaps. Um, also, um, just a neat side feature, not a big feature, but just because it's often overlooked, is that you can also um, change the recipient address, which is quite nice if otherwise you want to swap and um, and then send the funds over somewhere else you can do this in one go so you only pay one time transaction fee um, what is also nice is that you don't have to hold ether on your wallet um, because we have this intent based model what happens is that the user doesn't pay any gas costs in ether instead um, the execution cost is taken from their sell token so essentially you can even if you don't hold ETH. You can trade on CowSwap. Um, 
And then there's, of course, also like more advanced features. For example, if you want to place limit orders, this is possible in CalSolve as well. Um, we recently <clears throat> also added TWAP orders. <clears throat> this means that you can have time weighted oh. average price trades. So if you, for example, want to sell an asset over time, um, for example, every day sell $1,000 worth of ESA or every day buy $1,000 worth of ESA or do this <clears throat> on a weekly or monthly basis, you can do this. Um, yeah, Felix, I don't know if you have other things that come to mind you want to add. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, no, no failed transaction costs. I mean, you kind of alluded to it that you don't need any ETH, but, but I think um, maybe actually the feature that people in the early days appreciated the most was that we took care of the transaction management for you. Nice. Specifically, when we launched, uh, gas fees were still very high. You had these like humongous, you know, $200, $300 failed transactions, which of course are extremely painful. You don't get anything for your transaction, but you've paid $200 worth of ETH. Um, and and CalSwap doesn't have that because as a user, you're just signing a, an off-chain message. You hand that off-chain message to um, the you know, protocol, which then gives it for to solvers to compete for. And then solvers actually take care of executing the transaction for you. So they decide on the right gas price. They um, can protect themselves by a... You know, private RPC submissions or other kind of more sophisticated ways against revert costs or against being front run themselves. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, you basically the, the solver bids for your execution. And, and once they win the right to execute you, that is the price that you are guaranteed. And then it's up to the solver to make sure that they are not getting sandwiched, that they are not getting their slippage tolerance extracted. Um, and so we are kind of moving this, the, the responsibility for getting best execution away from the user to a more sophisticated party. And I think that's really, you know, for the average user, just um, yeah, much, much more convenient. And, and we've seen that um, competitors in the space have adopted this intent-based trading model. They haven't yet gone uh, ahead and, and actually, you know, also, are, they're not yet doing batching or any of the other, like, more advanced stuff we're doing, but at least the idea of, don't let retail users execute their own transactions. That's just too complex. Is definitely an idea that CalSwap has pioneered and that has been um, adopted throughout the space, I think, by now. I was actually going to ask because, you know, I think you guys have like quite a few unique features that uh, that you guys combine actually with your product but i don't think that uh, on many places i've seen even uh, one of these uh, uh, attributes and please correct me if i'm wrong like because i'm, I'm pretty sure that like uh, people are uh, like taking reference and taking notes and like are there all kinds of implementations that uh, like uh, people people are taking like some of your uh, like um, new features and trying to implement them on their own uh, like uh, products do you guys see it happening already yeah i think so i mean we've seen i think the first main competitor to um, i mean competitor they also solve us in a way you know they, we, we would like them to to see us more as like a part of the ecosystem but uh, one product that has been um co not copying but has that has like um, taken some inspiration on our on our model was was one inch with a uh, one inch fusion in their model, they also allow users to sign um, off-chain messages that they then send off to their uh, backend system. In their system, the uh, matching engines are called resolvers. They don't use um, a pure surplus maximization kind of model where they just ask all resolvers what is the best price you can execute and, and grant the right to the best one. Instead, they have a... Um, Dutch kind of uh, auction um, based on the user order. So you, you imagine that if uh, you see that the price of Ether is $2,000 and you want to sell one Ether, then you would actually place an order that says, I want to sell an Ether at $2,100. Um, that's not possible right now. Nobody will give you $2,100 for your Ether. Uh, but then your order is programmed in a way where it like decays over time. So after a couple of minutes, it might be hitting the two thousand dollars that you expected um, to to be to be matched at, and then as you go uh, further, it might go to one thousand nine hundred or one thousand eight hundred. And um, yeah, basically the, the the resolvers are then um, free to execute your order as soon as they'd like. So with every block, your limit price goes a little bit lower, a little bit lower. 
little bit lower. And then as soon as your limit price is achievable with on-chain market uh, liquidity or with private market liquidity or whatever um, res resolvers would want to use, they can go and execute it. The drawback here is, first of all, that um, this Dutch decay curve takes some time. Right? Like, um, so if you really want to make sure that uh, you get the sweet spot of the best execution price, you cannot have your price fall too steeply. So you need to actually say, well, uh, um, you know, we actually experimented with this in, in Gnosis at the very beginning, I think 2017, where we um, tried to do uh, trading using Dutch orders. Uh, we called it slow trade at the time because it was really, really, really slow and, and it took a lot of time to actually <laughs> make sure that, that those orders are not exploitable. Because what happens when you're trying to make them fast is that actually every step on your, on your Dutch decay curve becomes kind of a big step. Right. If you say I want to go from two thousand one hundred dollars to nineteen hundred dollars in the course of two blocks, then all you can do is, well, at block one, you're at two thousand and at block two, you're at one thousand nine hundred dollars, which means that if the true price of Ether is somewhere in the middle, let's say it's at two thousand fifty, then it's not possible to fill you at the first block. It's not yet good enough. But then at the second block, your limit price is already $50 below the fair market price. And then in the Fusion model, and frankly, also in the Uniswap X model, there is no incentive for the resolver or for the filler to give you that extra improvement to match you at $2,050. Their mechanism is entirely targeted to match you at exactly that limit price that you have within the block, whereas the CowSwap model really runs this auction with an open-ended upside and just says, whoever gives the user the best execution, may it be 2050, 2051, gets the right to execute. And so when it comes to surplus maximization and best execution, um, you know, even though they use the intent-based trading model and offload the complexity of executing transactions to professional parties, the end-of-day execution is at least an expectation still better on, on Cow Protocol. And on that, CowSwap is uh, unique at the moment. Like, are you the only guys uh, offering that? Yes. What Felix said essentially is that um, One Inch Fusion had like this it's a slight differentiation from us, where they also take user intents, right? Which makes this whole processing, post processing of the order by third parties such as solvers, fillers, resolvers, however they are called possible. But then the exact model they implemented is differing in the way that he just described and then a few months later last year summer uniswap also copied the same model they're calling it uniswap x but it is more similar to the one inch model with the same drawbacks and then they also had a little bit of a different naming convention and what we call solvers and one inch calls resolvers they call fillers but yeah essentially very clear um copy it from the high level idea from CowSwap and it's also what they publicly reference. I'm not sure how this saying uh, goes in English, but they say something like uh, imitation is the most sincere uh, form of flattery, something like that. No, and it definitely got um, generally the intent a lot of traction. And I think that was also favorable for us to some extent. Um, oh, we have no. for, for now, as, Clo coming close to three years of being live. And we have always pushed for this intent-based model because it is something that we truly believe is improving user experience. Like if you want to gain mass adoption for Ethereum, if you want to get the next user wave on, you need to have something um, that is providing a good UX that is able to abstract a lot of the complexity from blockchain away. And this is possible with intents. And I think since there was like the adoption first by one inch and now also by Uniswap of a similar model. It's also, it also gave intense, generally much more awareness. And I think this is overall good for the ecosystem. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we, we had a pair protocol on uh, the last episode and they also are building with this intent based model. Um, so it's really clear to see that it's not only just being developed on the derivative side of things, but also the spot side of things over here as well, which is great to see. Um, do you think intents are going to give like CowSwap that product market fit to really uh, go on and grow you know, to a unicorn level or anything like that in terms of users, volume? fees, all the kind of uh, metrics that we like to look at when it comes to DeFi? 
I mean, intense, we have, like I said, like we have had those since the beginning. I think what yeah. makes us stand out is like one, the batching mechanism that Felix described in detail, which is like really an added benefit on top that's not so easy to copy. And that also by the current implementation design from one inch fusion and Uniswap X is not really feasible to implement. Mm -hmm. Um, but then other than that, I think what's also outstanding for us is our ability to innovate. Like that was something else Felix was alluding to towards the beginning of the call, <clears throat> a new product that we're launching um, next week, or at least an initial version of this, which is like this LVR resistant cow AMM design. So, that, and I think it's really like, even though we are a small team, we are, um, quite innovative and like new concepts we are trying to adopt and bring into the ecosystem. And I think that really makes us stand out. By the way, uh, when you say small, how small? Um, we are 28 people at the moment. Oh, not, not, not tiny. Not tiny, but I think like if you compare us to one inch or Uniswap, they have a yeah. around 150 or so wow. people. So definitely smaller in comparison. I think that sometimes actually throughout organizations, I think that, uh, you know, being as lean as possible is sometimes uh, quite an advantage on the innovation uh, front as well. Uh, like uh, less friction, less bu bureaucracy, e easier to make, to take the right decision maybe. Yeah, I fully agree. I think it's also just easier to keep everyone aligned, to have like really easy communication flow within the company. And like exactly have no bureaucracy overhead, but essentially we really try to foster every talent that we have and like have really um, a lot of smart people in our teams. And we really want to like listen to all the, the good ideas that have come up within the team. How do you guys uh, run your team, by the way? I was just going to ask them, like, how do you guys run your team? Like, you've got 28 people. How do you keep things organized? How do you arrange things? Uh, who, deci who decides uh, on, like, what's going to happen next, etc.? cetera? Um, we try to be as much unhierarchical as possible. So we have a lot of different departments, like a back-end team, a front-end team, a solver team, marketing, business development, analytics. And essentially, each of these teams have their own team lead. And usually we, we have like weekly things and then we cross the line on priorities. And um, yeah, on a high level, that's pretty much it. And we really want to have also this bottom up approach and encouraging each team to come up with their own ideas, what they think is going to be impactful. And, and yeah, I would say just a lot of the communication happens. Um, we try to even have as much communication as possible in the very open for the open source community to also um, contribute. So if you look at our forum, if you look at our Discord, if you look at our GitHubs, uh, you know, a lot of the discourse is available for, for everyone. Um, and then internally in the company, the development company, we um, yeah, try to you know, have, you know, it's, it sounds very cliche, but like a, a meritocratic approach where, you know, if, if, a decision has to be taken by Anna or myself because we can't decide what the obvious best way forward is, then that's like a failure case, I'd say. Um, and unless this is like a naming question or some something else that's very subjective, then um, we, we, yeah, we, we try to not even get into this to this mode. And um, yeah, but everything else that Anna said is also correct about our culture. <laughs> Sounds good. The advisor, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it actually relates to what you asked because I'm very curious about like, you know, the, the specific culture that some organizations have and are able to maintain that in my opinion, in the long run, separates them from others because, you know, like for sure people are different, but you know, like there are so many different like places to swap things uh, you know what i mean like uh, when you say uh, mm, swap it's like the most common uh, thing in uh, crypto pretty much so uh, in order to actually like build around that narrative and actually do something different what what i'm very, very much curious about is like how does that uh, how does that even evolve like from from what kind of an organizational culture or like a vision of uh, people comes out something that uh, a product which is, uh, you know, really very much unique. I think that CowSwap uh, has really 
some uh, attributes and features that are simply very much different than uh, most uh, places you can swap uh, things that, that, that are much more similar to one another. And I'm very curious, like, like, do you guys even talk about that kind of thing? Like, is that kind of language, does it even exist? Or is it just, uh, you know, the, the specific uh, quality of the people that you are and like the different uh, characters that just brought you here and it's all like, uh, who knows what, what got us here? I think what stands out is our mission to put the user first. And I think this is always like when we talk about how to design the protocol itself and certain features around it, we always take it from the angle, okay, how can we put the user first? How can we make it easy on the user? How can we protect the user? And even if you take it to the extreme on how we are now charging fees, it's um, the initial reward of the fees is very limited in how it is impacting the user and it's very, very incentive aligned with the user. Um, so for now, we are only charging um, on out-of-market limit orders um, for which we are in a unique position compared to one inch or anyone else who's offering limit orders that we are able to execute um, the user at a better price than a limit order. Everywhere else, essentially, you place a limit order. You say, I want to buy ETH at 2000 or I want to sell it at 2800 whatever. Um, you would be executed at exactly that price point. And on CowSwap, you can actually get a better execution. So let's say you wanted to um, buy it at or sell it at two, uh, 2,800. It could be that for your ESA, you even get 2,900. So you get an additional $100 that you wouldn't get anywhere else. And this is essentially where we would now um, start charging a fee and take a percentage cut of the additional money you receive that you would not receive anywhere else. So really on all levels, um, we are trying to be very value aligned with the users and place them first in all, this, in all design decisions that we are taking. That's so cool. Can you, uh, can you maybe explain again, uh, for me at least, where, where does that extra incentive come from? Like, how are you guys able to extract uh, like the, this uh, extra hundred dollars, like you said in your example? So and maybe just before we start, just to, because because the the name limit order is just very um, you know people people understand different things when we when we say limit order. And Anna, you said out of market limit orders, which is what we usually refer to when we when we talk about the um, those types of limit orders. But just maybe to make it very clear. Uh, when when we when we say out of market limit order, we mean a an order which at the current market rate is not fillable. So let's say today I haven't checked, but ether is somewhere between two thousand three hundred and two thousand five hundred dollars. An out of market limit order would be I'm selling ether at two thousand eight hundred, like an honest example. So right now the order is not executable. It's not like your uni swap swap limit order where you say I want to sell ether. Price is two thousand three hundred, and I am willing to sell for as low as two thousand two hundred. But then, yeah, and I could go ahead, please. Um, so yeah, essentially, if I place this type of order and I'm saying, okay, I want to um, sell my ether two thousand eight hundred, what happens again is we have like this: um, the user just signs the transaction, and then we have this third-party competition of our servers um, who are optimizing for best possible user execution. So what could happen is that at time of execution, the actual on-chain price is actually a bit higher, right? Um, and so this, the, since the server competition is aiming at the server who finds the best possible execution for the user is the one who actually wins the competition, the servers are incentivized to give this better price point forwarded to the user rather than pocketing it themselves, right? So essentially then when the trade gets executed, there is the possibility that the user receives what we refer to as the surplus, a higher value than what they actually asked for in the limit order. And, and maybe to bring it back down to the, like the fundamentals of, of blockchains, we have, you know, different new information every 15 or 12 seconds uh, on Ethereum today, and you are placing a limit order to, uh, let's say, sell Ether at $2,800. What are the odds that the price of ETH when that order is executable is exactly 2800 
not probably it's not going to be like way off but you know it could be 2801 or 2802 the price of eth is not continuous per block it it makes a you know, jump um between on every block and so basically cowswap is able to capture that difference between your limit price and the fair market price which no other limit order protocol is able to capture at the moment and um, yeah of that value um, as anna said we align um, incentives and and um, the, the dao has decided to you know, start experimenting um, charging some some fees from from that um, from that value but even bringing it back to like the main topic of i think you asked how does the product as cows were evolve and i think i just brought the fee model as an example because this is usually where a lot of protocols are not aligned with the users anymore because they need to somehow survive um so that's an extreme case scenario where we are very like still focusing on the user first but really we try to do it on on all aspects if it's like giving a lot of warnings in case that um and the user is um, trying to place a trade that is not feasible because gas costs, for example, are super high at the moment and like a majority of their trade would be lost to gas. So there's a warning of OV, right? Are you really sure you want to place this, execute this trade? Um, <clears throat> and it's reflected in all design choices from this intent-based model of having an auction that is really um, incentivizing or like rewarding only the server who provides the best execution price for the user to win the competition. We have additional protect, like users are protected um, by also whatever um, solution the server um, is winning with this, the, is being forwarded to the user. So for example, even if the server would end up getting a slightly worse execution than what they initially won the competition with, the user is still guaranteed this price point. So really on every level, it's like putting the user first and ensuring that um, yeah, they, they get the best execution. Um, could Do you mind if uh, we ask about uh, the, this revenue share model, um, like this extra revenue that comes from these um, out of the market limit orders, where, where exactly is it going? Um, and uh, yeah, if you could tell us about that, please. Um, yeah, so it's partly still going to the user and then the, the fee model that we started charging since a week ago um, is for now going into the DAO. And so it's up to the cow token holders to decide what to do with it down the line. Um, for example, it can flow into additional um, ecosystem development. We also have this grand star program um, that is rewarding anyone who's building on top of cow protocol so this would be one potential avenue but it's yeah it's up to the token holders for now it's collected in the in Cardo's treasury and do you have any um analytics on like how much volume and how much revenue so far you've achieved in one week yes we do there's also a dashboard and um, i think in one week we made felix correct me if i'm wrong i think it was around 13 ether oh nice yeah, I mean, it's still very early days and it's still fluctuating a lot. And um, yeah, we, we um, are also looking into increasing our market share across limit orders. Um, but yeah, we I, I wouldn't take those numbers as like what we, you know, will uh, hope uh, the, the protocol will, will, will make as a revenue once once fully mature. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a start. And I think the main date from the DAO is also to try out different fee models. So we might... Um, the devil, yeah, we might experiment with a few different types of, of um, revenue streams. But as Anna said, our main goal is to put the user first and not um, yeah, jeopardize the, the execution quality and, and basically the, the, the protecting the user for yeah, the DAO revenue. Yeah, and I think also to the DAO, it's just more important to continuously gain growth and market share rather than trying to extract as much value as possible. Uh, understandably so. Um, what well, you mentioned uh, this focus around users, um, and I see at the moment that uh, CowSwap or Cow Protocol is on two specific chains, uh, Gnosis Chain and Ethereum Mainnet, of course. Um, one of the things that I see when I look at like users is I see them now moving over to places like Solana. We've seen Jupiter have massive success uh, being an aggregator as well, uh, and really like the low fee model attracting like significantly more users does cow protocol have any uh, plans to move over to let's say arbitrum or kind of some more ethereum aligned chains uh, what's the plan in terms of like user growth and user acquisition this is one of the most popular 
request users <laughs> when when I choose when whatever and other network. Um, of course. Yes. The answer is uh, we are now like it's been like in our priorities for a while, but like always juggling what is what is going to have the highest impact. Um, but finally, we are committed to roll out to at least one more network in Q2. Um, and then from from there, we will take it. We are currently assessing essentially what is like the potential volumes we can expect, who of our users is currently um, also trading on what are the networks, what's the competition landscape like, how much is MEV a problem, because obviously this is like a, one of the core issues we are solving. Um, so I can't tell you yet which one is going to be the first one we will, we will deploy CowSwap on, but it's definitely coming and it's finally coming soon and we are committed. Do we have uh, any chains that you're definitely not going to be building on? Even if we had, I don't think it would be nice to mention it now. <laughs> I mean, I mean, long term, the protocol is agnostic towards you know all chains, right? We we just want to you know, serve users that want to um, make make swaps. Um, I, I think you know realistically, we are looking for EVM compatible chains to begin with, and the more uh, aligned with Ethereum in terms of technology and in terms of um, ease of deploying something that runs on Ethereum on that chain, uh, the better. So. You know, I think with that, you, you will have a little bit of an idea of which chains are less likely to, to be um, in the first in the first list. No, it sounds Waj, great. Waj, ask, Go ahead. Waj asked earlier about uh, like uh, the new uh, stats about uh, the the revenue. I'm curious, like, is there are there metrics saying like how much money was saved by uh, CowSwap for users uh, throughout its uh, existence? Like, uh, how, how much are we actually talking about? Like, how many? How much did people uh, actually save on trades because of the fact that they used uh, CowSwap instead of uh, other alternatives? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's different ways of how you can look at this number, um, yeah. right? Uh, there is this study that was released a couple of weeks ago by uh, the Barter team, who is a solver within the CowSwap ecosystem, saying that if you looked at all trades on Ethereum, uh, you could, uh, and, and you would match them in one of these like multidimensional batch auctions like Cow Protocol does, you could save up to, uh, it was $1.5 million a day, I think. Uh, those are, of course, not the numbers that have actually been saved those are just theoretic numbers that with yeah. the current usage of ethereum we could save if we got everyone to um you know trade on a on a batching layer uh if you if you look at it from the cow protocol perspective i am not uh, i mean basically the way that i would define it there is the um the positive quote deviation um so if a user expects a price x to receive and at the end they get a price that's better than what they expected then um, sure, this could be due to price movement and, and and slippage, but it could also be due to the fact that we found a more effective route that we were able to um, trade people um, and do these like peer to peer coincidence of wants. Um, and so, what we've been looking at is the um, average uh, price deviation uh, from what we quote, and we know that we are quoting quite well. Um, we have data from DeFi Lama and and other. Uh, swap aggregators that say our quote quality is quite competitive and then what do people actually receive after the fact and the last time I checked which was a couple of months ago I think it was 10 basis points um, improvement between the quote and the actual execution price and then if you look at um, our monthly volume for instance in January was I think 1.9 billion dollars and so if you compute 0.1% um, from uh, 1.9 million billion dollars then I don't have the calculator here but that would give you a a lot of money. Yeah, that, that would that would give you the the value that Cowswap has created um, just in a in a single month. That's that's actually very remarkable, to be honest. Such such a useful service. I think that's uh, one of the things that I uh, like about it the most. And I told you it uh, on uh, when you were on the show uh, with Sam uh, Felix that uh, me recently I I mostly used uh, DeFi Llama Swap in order to do my trades. And honestly, it uh, like by far the protocol, uh, like the project that gives the most is Cowswap. And, uh, and like you said, something needs to be checked there about the- Yeah, we still need to figure out why just the most. Yeah, so, so we definitely need to figure out why. We actually have an idea why we might not be doing super well on, on small trades because there's um, 
with the batching, there comes a little bit of a gas overhead that it, it, that's a very technical reason, but um, yeah, you need to verify one more signature in an intent based trading system versus in a non intent based trading mm -hmm. system. And so for small trades, that extra gas can be um, interesting to, to decide which is, which is your best option. And so um, a non intent based system might have a slight advantage, but we actually have an idea of how we can um, forward some of the actual price improvements you will get in the end through coincidence of wants, through um, internal buffer trading and in, inside the, the settlement contract. All these are like you know, very, very technical terms, but uh, to, to improve the, the quotes we show for um, also small trade sizes. So, so we're looking into, uh, yeah, hopefully being the best on DeFi Lama for, for all trades. Uh, awesome, awesome. Um, one thing I just wanted to ask uh, was, uh, we mentioned it slightly earlier on, we didn't get time to uh, dive in. Um, could you tell us about this AMM model? Yeah, yeah, so... Um, I mean, this this idea started a long a long time ago um, in a forum post. I think just after Bogota DefCon in in, in Bogota. Uh, but the idea basically being that uh, it, when I look at MEV, there's three main pillars of MEV. The the one most toxic and most um, painful one to for everyday users is sandwich arbitrage being being front run by by MEV bots and getting your slippage tolerance um, extracted. Uh, this is the one that we focus on primarily with CowSwap and, and basically have to a degree solved. Um, the other two main contributors of MEV are um, what is known as LVR, loss versus rebalancing, um, basically the um, adverse selection that uh, passive LP providers uh, receive by being arbitraged um, from professional entities like market makers when the price on Binance changes. Uh, you still have the outdated price on the AMM, uh, but the arbitrageur knows what the new price is. And so they can come in and, and kind of buy all the liquidity up to the new price. But because the way that the AMM works, they sell you a little bit at the old price, then a little bit at a slightly better price and so on and so on. So your average price is actually worse than what the, the, the new price on the, um, on, on the centralized exchange is. And, and so that difference between centralized exchange price and your average um, price for the passive liquidity provider is what's, what's known as loss versus rebalancing. And if you look at the absolute numbers, actually loss versus rebalancing is a huge amount of tax that is currently not actually captured by arbitrageurs because in order for arbitrageurs to have access to that um, opportunity, they need to make sure that they get the first slot in the block. They need to, they need to be the very first person that, that is able to access that, that stale outdated liquidity. And in order to do so, they need to bribe the vast majority of their arbitrage profits to the validator to actually pay for that access to get the first slot. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the vast chunk of LVR is currently paid in the form of priority fees or, or minor bribes to um, validators, yay Ethereum holders, but uh, it comes at the cost that basically everyone or you know, the vast majority of people that are providing liquidity passively are being uh, taken advantage of. Then the third part uh, of MEV is, is um, in my mind, um, liquidation arbitrage. We've recently seen some in interesting proposals on how this could be tackled on an infrastructure level. Again, I think that with a um, you know, holistic batch auction and one price per token per block, um, also liquidations would be um, solvable with, with, with something like um, Cow Protocol. But if you look at the relative importance, then sex dex arbitrage LVR is still significantly more important than the last part. And so what we are trying to build now is a novel um, a novel AMM that is not prone to this kind of always lagging behind and always trading at the outdated price and therefore being taken advantage of by somebody that has more information and rather incorporate that AMM into the cow protocol batch and apply the same philosophy that we have for traders. Everyone gets executed at exactly the same uniform clearing price, which if you think about it is the new um, price because it's what solvers compete for. It's the most competitive price you can find on the market. It's it's the new equilibrium price. Everyone gets executed at that price and nobody gets executed at like their limit price or their outdated kind of, you know, stale price. And so by modeling a trader like an AMM, by having them express their limit order as a X times Y equals K kind of, you know, constant product uh, formula, but making them part of the surplus maximization problem. So asking solvers to not give them their limit price, but give them whatever they can better than their limit price. 
we basically divert the tax that is currently paid to the validators in the form of bribes into refunds that are paid to the LP providers to boost their profitability, to boost the economic viability of providing passive liquidity on Ethereum and basically make the whole system uh, less taxing and, and, and more healthy. Ah, that's so interesting. That is very interesting. So validators will make a little bit less, but liquidity providers will uh, make up for it. Uh, and hopefully that should attract more liquidity and grow and reduce slippage and all these other things as well. Do, does this mean that um, uh, CowSwap will be directly competing with the likes of Uniswap, building your own AMM? So I, I don't think so, um, at least for now, what we're trying to experiment with is taking this way of market making as a novel form of people managing their own portfolios and not necessarily pooling into somebody else's kind of big LP pool and, and using that as kind of a, an investment strategy. So it's, it's, it's I think the, the target audience for now is very different. So we're looking at we were going to start with CowDAO. CowDAO is, is going to um, vote next week on whether we should um, experiment with this model and, and, and basically try it out with, with our own uh, treasury. But then our goal would be to look at other decentralized organizations in the space that have large treasuries and want to market make those treasuries without being taken advantage of um, through LVR and other means. And based on the success and, and based on seeing how, how, how good this model then works in practice, we you know, would revisit or reevaluate if maybe we can partner with a, with a protocol that, that has experience in building a consumer facing LP product, um, because we know that you know, they, a lot of companies have failed trying to compete there. And, and um, it's, it's not just the idea and you know, just what we did with CowSwap, you need a super compelling user experience and a great product. And, yeah. I mean, Anna, you can probably you know, talk more about, about, about that aspect, but yeah, we, we, are, we are not yet competing directly with any of the other um, payments. Okay. And uh, does Cal Protocol um, capture any value from this as well in terms of fees or revenue? So at the end of the day, all this trading volume is part of the Cal Protocol's trading volume. And so whatever yeah. fee mechanism Cal Protocol will take and where it benefits from more volume and more activity on on the platform better prices better price improvements for users um, that will you know feed into the the long-term success of, of of the protocol so we while we haven't yet in the proposal that's being voted on decided on look here is exactly how the this this model can be monetized um, i think the the main goal is to make it successful and if it's successful it will be flourishing for the for the whole protocol and it would be a piece of cake to then uh, capture some of that added value um, for the DAO itself. No, that's brilliant. I can't wait for that. Definitely. It's definitely inspiring to, to, to like see the way that you guys are looking at some of the issues that are part of the industry for so long. But it definitely feels like you guys are uh, being able to, like, you guys have been success, successful in coming up with some very creative solutions that are kind of like uh, changing the way uh, a specific uh, uh, topic is even uh, thought. And I think that the, the fact that some uh, are also trying to take inspiration uh, slash copy the stuff that uh, you're doing is the best uh, testament. Uh, of it and uh, honestly it, it it is quite rem remarkable that something that uh, at least for the like uh, for my left curve uh, self seems to be like uh, that's supposed to be so simple i don't know swaps like aren't all swaps the same like and uh, what even that so and uh, i also on the show where when we had uh, felix with sam and also having you guys here right now can see all these like subtle differences and like uh, very different uh, like views on specific uh, concepts even with the just for example the gas fee uh, stuff the fact that you can actually do a trade without even uh, having any ETH uh, on which is not one of uh, I think uh, like the main characters of uh, CowSwap but all kinds of like innovative ways to uh, to address a specific problem in a very different way than it's been addressed uh, until uh, CowSwap uh, was there. And it's, it seems like uh, there's an issue, the industry is dealing with it uh, in a specific way on the swapping uh, front, but then CowSwap uh, comes and they find uh, like 
a really different solution, like not something that's like exactly what's uh, been tried before. And I think it's actually like, uh, I don't know the, the exact word in English uh, to, to say it, but it's like very ah, refreshing. It's very refreshing uh, to see this kind of uh, attitude being implemented. I did want to ask you guys a bit about uh, the cow token uh, uh, again, if I may. Do people need to lock it uh, in, in, in like the model that you are uh, like uh, seeing now? Like, th is it going to be like something like a VE cow or something like that? Or in order to, the, to enjoy like the revenue sharing, uh, will you just need to, uh, need to hodl it? Will you need to lock it in any uh, way? And also, by the way, uh, if you can maybe uh, share some uh, dry stats about the cow uh, token itself, because at least uh, personally, I I'm not uh, familiar with it. Like... Uh, how much of the supply is already out? Uh, how much is it going to be diluted? And like, uh, you know, this uh, very basic stuff. Sure. Um, maybe to start simple. Um, right now, uh, cow is by users or holders mostly used for participating in governance. Like I mentioned before, when we talked about the revenue stream, there's currently no concrete proposal yet on how to leverage it. Um, so essentially, as a cow holder, if you would, if you have an idea, if you think, oh, I want revenue distribution already, um, then you could go to the cowdow forum and make a proposal. And so it's completely open, up in the air, whether it would be oh, only people who stay cow will be able will be eligible for revenue share or not. This is completely up, open in the open. Um, but it is completely dependent on cow holders to make the proposals and then to vote for whatever solution they think is the best. Um, with regards to the, um, to oh, maybe one, one additional point that might be interesting to mention here is about the cow economics is that um, the idea behind charging a fee for the moment is also that it is collected in ease, but that it can be used to buy back cow tokens. So that's creating some buy demand. And then it's also up for voters to potentially decide if they want the cow token to be burned or if they want to use that for something else. Um, so essentially, like the, the long term usage of like how cow holders benefit from this is the open in the air. Um, when it comes to distribution, um, at inception, there was um, an airdrop, 10% of the total supply, the total supply is 1 billion, um, was given to the wider cow swap ecosystem. So this includes anyone who was like trading on cow swap before and like fulfilled certain criteria. I think it was like they had to place at least two trades on cow swap in the past um and a few other criteria like extra ways of how you were eligible for it um then there was 10 percent that were used for an investment round to raise um 15 million dollars in KYC seed funds that has been since or is continuously being used for development purposes around cow protocol um then there was an additional um, ability for uh, the wider cow swap ecosystem to participate in the investment round because it's usually like, oh, why do only investors um, become eligible for investment rounds with like preconditions that are usually quite favorable? Um, how is that fair that just a few funds get those opportunities, but like the people who actually support the ecosystem, like the traders, the ones who bring volume, who actively um, make their product useful usually don't get the same chance. So we came up with a pro with a concept that allowed anyone who was eligible uh, for the airdrop or was like a, like was a wider cow ecosystem member to participate in this investment round as well. We gave out ten percent of option, and I think half of them were taken up. So an additional five percent um, was given to community investors. Um, and then 
there was a distribution of 15% to the team, but it hasn't been all allocated. So this is also to be used for future hires and like to ensure that down the line, there's enough incentives for future team members um, to continuously evolve the cow protocol ecosystem. And then finally, there was a 10% allocation to Gnosis DAO because Gnosis DAO had initially bootstrapped the funding of Cow Protocol. So when cows were launched, we were still part of Gnosis. So they had funded the initial development and needed to be rewarded somehow um, when we spent out and became independent. Um, so the DAO is still holding roughly 50% of the tokens. And um, yeah, they are to be used for a server rewards payouts. This is essentially the main emission of tokens at the moment on a weekly basis, servers are being rewarded for their work. Um, and there actually the, the interesting part is the ideas of charging fees now is that they are increasingly being used for the server incentives until we reach a point where the revenue the protocol is making is larger than the incentive rewards that are being paid out to solvers. Um, yeah, do you have more questions about this? You're muted. I just, just wanna just wanna say that I mean the 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 when you said we uh, Gnosis DAO did the token launch, so everything up until the initial allocation, all of this is what uh, Gnosis DAO decided and and did, and and basically we are um, now also just tasked from the from Cowdow to develop the protocol and and run the development company. Um, but yeah, I mean we're part of Gnosis, so we. Where, where, you know, when, when we say we, we, we might con you know, see ourselves maybe as as a contributor to Gnosis DAO at the time, but just wanted to put that out there. Let's wrap up. Let's wrap up. So, um, uh, Anna and Felix, thank you so much for for coming on. We talked a lot about CowSwap, the development process, some of the stuff coming out with the AMM design as well as tokenomics as well. We covered lots of different things. Um, so, thank you to both of you uh, for coming on. Where can people learn about CowSwap and kind of learn more? Go to the app. Uh, why could, can they join the Discord as well? We always like to keep our Twitter up to date with our um, new recent news announcements. It's uh, at CowSwap. Um, and then, yeah, we are also very active on Discord. So any questions that you have about the grants program or about features or feedback or whatever it might be, partnerships, um, it's best to join our Discord server. We have a very active moderator called Master Cow, um, who's very responsive. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Uh, so yeah, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, maybe we could do another show in future uh, where we discuss future CowSwap products. But for now, uh, it was a pleasure to have you guys on today. Thank with you. The so pace thank you, guys. Are, with the pace that you guys are innovating, we'll probably need to do uh, another show uh, in a few months. Much respect for the work you do, guys. Thank you so much for your time and for coming. Waj, really enjoyed uh, recording this one with you as always. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let us know in the comments whatever you think, whatever you want, uh, whatever, whatever we should have asked and didn't, and what else do you want to know about CowSwap. Thank you so much again, Anna and Felix. Bye, folks. Waj. Bye. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Anna, hey. thank